Why was God going to kill Moses? A Torah event is found in Exodus 4, 24 to 26, and is one of the most mysterious events in the Torah. The event, frankly, runs counter to our modern logic. During this time, God came to kill Moses after God commissioned him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. The Old Testament recognizes Moses as an important figure chosen to save God's people. On the other hand, Abraham, also known as the father of the faithful, received God's unconditional covenant of grace. God specifically chose Moses to lead the Israelites from captivity in Egypt to the Promised Land, where they would find salvation. Additionally, Moses is known as a mediator of the Old Covenant and is often referred to as the one who gave the law. Finally, Moses is the principal author of the Pentateuch, the foundational books of the entire Bible. Moses' role in the Old Testament is a type and shadow of Jesus' role in the New Testament. As such, his life is worth examining. We first encounter Moses in the opening chapters of the book Exodus. Despite being born to a Hebrew slave, he was adopted by the Egyptian royal family. However, he left Egypt and became an outcast. He fled to the desert where God prepared him for the important role he would play in the future. The next major incident in Moses' life was his encounter with God at the burning bush, where God called Moses to be his people's savior. Exodus 3, 1 to 10, Amplified Bible. Now Moses was keeping the flock of Jephro, Raoul, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to the Horeb, Sinai, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was on fire, yet it was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn away from the flock and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned away from the flock to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then God said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, out of respect, because the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have in fact seen the affliction, suffering, desolation of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, oppressors. For I know their pain and suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand, power of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to a land that is good and spacious, to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and then bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Although Moses was initially hesitant, and even asked God to send someone else, he eventually agreed to obey God's command. As a promise, God sent Moses' brother Aaron to accompany him on his journey. The well-known story continues with Moses and Aaron approaching Pharaoh in God's name, demanding that he release the people so they may worship their God. At God's command and with Jephro's blessing, Moses returned to Egypt 40 years after leaving for Midian. He was accompanied by his wife, Zipporah, and his sons, Gershom and Eliza, Exodus 4, 21, 23, the New King James Version. God was going to kill Moses because of sin. The sin of Moses in Exodus 4, 24 to 26 is not stated explicitly, but the surrounding events give substantial clues as to the nature of Moses' transgression. God had instructed his messenger to warn Pharaoh to free Israel, or Pharaoh would lose his firstborn son. God had specially groomed Moses for eight years for this mission, and now the time for action had come. God was going to kill Moses because of sin. Exodus 4, 24-26, Amplified Bible. 
Now it happened at the lodging place that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him, making him deathly ill because he had not circumcised one of his sons. Then Zipporah took a flint knife and cut off the foreskin of her son and threw it at Moses' feet and said, Indeed, you are a husband of blood to me. So he let Moses alone to recover. At that time, Zipporah said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. The sin of Moses is not explicitly stated in Exodus 4, 24-26, but the surrounding events provide significant clues as to the nature of Moses' transgression. Moses was to lead his people out of Egypt and be an example to Pharaoh's house, the Egyptian nation, and all the nations who heard about what happened. We read, The Lord met him and sought to kill him. This is a mysterious occasion, but it seems God is confronting Moses in the strongest possible way. Because Moses had not circumcised his son. God demands that this be set right before Moses enters Egypt and begins to fulfill the call of God. There is often a point of confrontation in the leader's wife where God mandates that they lay aside some area of compromise and will not allow them to advance further until they do. A popular Bible commentator stated, There can be no doubt that for some reason unrecorded, Moses had failed to carry out the divine instruction concerning circumcision. Obedience completely established, everything moved forward. We read, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. Perhaps Zipporah objected to the right of circumcision. She was not an Israelite and may have thought it a barbaric custom. Perhaps this was why God held Moses accountable for not doing what was right even though his wife didn't like it, but disabled Moses so that Zipporah had to perform the circumcision. Some wonder why Moses' wife seemed so bitter here. Perhaps for the first time she recognized the serious nature of her husband's call and how important it was for their whole family to walk in the way of the Lord. As a result, before directing the spiritual lives of the Hebrew people, Moses' personal life had to be in order. Moses appeared to have neglected to perform the sacred rite of circumcision, which symbolized the almighty covenant with his chosen people. This could have been due to pressure from his surrogate Midianite tribe. It's also possible that he was persuaded not to circumcise his son by Zipporah, who found the practice unique. This would illustrate her violent outburst. Whatever the reason, Moses' unresolved sin rendered him unfit to serve as a spiritual leader, and the situation needed to be resolved before he could carry out his mission effectively. Indeed, the Lord let him go as soon as Zipporah performed the act. This story is complicated to understand because of its brevity and the unusual wording of verse 24. The Lord sought to kill Moses. Though the phrasing of the verse may evoke dark images of God tiptoeing about the encampment, waiting to ambush Moses, the fact that God would kill someone is not unusual in other contexts. God slew the wicked in the Great Flood because of their violent and ungodly actions. The Lord destroyed Ur and Onan, two of Judah's sons, because of their overt rebellion. Genesis 38, 7, Amplified Bible. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him in judgment. In Moses' later years, God would legislate the death penalty for those guilty of disobeying specific laws. In these instances, and many more, God slayed a person or persons, albeit indirectly. In Exodus 4, we can be assured that Moses was afflicted because he was guilty of some sin since disobedience is the only act God punishes with death. Accordingly, Moses' personal life had to be in order before he could direct the spiritual lives of the Hebrew people. It seems that Moses had neglected to administer the sacred rite of circumcision, which symbolized the Almighty's covenant with his chosen people. Though the details of this mysterious story are absent, the underlying message is plain. Disobedience, whether by acts of omission or commission, results only in punishment and ultimately death. The key to this passage is realizing that Moses was not properly circumcised. Growing up in Egypt, Moses and the rest of the Israelites did not fully remove the male foreskin. Growing up in the Egyptian royal home, it could not have been otherwise. During the time of Joshua, 
the Israelites underwent a second circumcision. This involved the complete removal of the foreskin. Joshua 5, 2-3, Amplified Bible. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives and circumcise the new generation of the sons of Israel, as was done before. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeah Haraloth. All of this sounds trivial, gross, and strange to the ears of modern Christian believers, but clearly it was not how Yahweh saw this situation. To clarify, Israelites could receive deliverance without being circumcised, but the leader of the Exodus was required to meet a higher standard. Moses was about to embark on Operation Exodus, without the sign of the Abrahamic Covenant on him or his son Gershom. When God came to seek his life, Moses' Medianite wife, Zipporah, intervened to save him. God's wrath was turned away by the blood of the Son and decisive, redemptive action of a Midianite woman. Circumcision was not only a sign to the man of his entrance to the Abrahamic covenant. It also served as a sign to his bride that the man she's marrying was, in fact, a worshipper of the Most High God. A man who was properly circumcised was a bridegroom of blood to her. We must ask ourselves, how do we serve God acceptably? It is one thing to walk with God and serve Him the way we want to, and yet another thing to serve Him according to the pattern or manner He desires. Remember when He told Saul that obedience is better than sacrifice? 1 Samuel 15.22 but Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. This meant we can't seek to serve God on our terms, only in line with His known will. It is essential to distinguish between these because so many people have vehemently asserted that they have walked with God and done His will, only for God to say, Depart from me. Matthew 7, 21, 23 Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in equity. So how do we walk with God and serve him acceptably? We must genuinely dedicate to God. Dedication speaks of a commitment from the heart that isn't easily disconnected or discouraged. When we are truly dedicated to God, we naturally enjoy his covering and that absolute heart commitment pleases him. God doesn't just want obedience from us as our Father, he also desires gladness in our service by being diligent and consistent in every assignment God has given us. Romans 12:11, Amplified Bible, talks about never lagging behind in diligence, a glow in the Spirit, enthusiastically serving the Lord. God is delighted when we give our best to the instructions he lays at our hearts at different times. Stewardship to God requires a certain level of sacrifice. This is because sometimes obedience may be inconvenient to our flesh, even though it is necessary to walk in God's blessings down the line. Psalms 55, Amplified Bible says, Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Sacrifice usually involves our time, skill, energy, time, and resources to seek that the kingdom of God advances on the earth. Daniel comes to mind when we talk about this kind of sacrifice. He left his comfort as one of the king's top advisors and put his life on the line just to stay dedicated to God in prayers. Abraham also knew what serving God sacrificially felt like. There is a very close bond between our love and where our treasures go into. This is probably why serving God often stretches beyond our attitudes to our material possessions.